Five, four, okay. three. Hello, and welcome to another episode of UA Overtime. This is going to be our last episode of the semester, as next week is finals week, as everybody knows. Last night was a big night in sports. We had NBA games, um, an NFL Thursday night game, and the college football awards. Our first uh, quarter topic, however, is going to be about the NBA. Last night, the New York Knicks, on the top of the East right now, beat the Heat by 20 points for the second time this year. So we're going to get our reactions to that game first. Dylan. I was extremely pumped with last night's Knicks performance. I, I didn't give them much of a chance without Melo. And then with how terrible J.R. Smith was in the first half, I thought the Heat were going to pull away. But Raymond fell and Steve Novak stepped up big time. Felton, I think, had 27. Novak had 18. It was a huge team win. They gave the Heat their first loss at home all season. And in a game where they really needed a big contribution from everybody, the bench gave them 57 points. It was a true team win, and I was really pleased with it. I was really happy to see that. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, as a Knicks fan, it's good to see them win a big game like that, especially for um, a 20-point win over one of the best players, LeBron James, right now. And I'm kind of disappointed. Um, I'm definitely a Knicks fan, but I'm disappointed with the way that D. Wade has presented himself. He had four turnovers, turnovers last night. He's not looking like he has been. I think he's fallen off the map a little bit, but it's good to see the Knicks win. Right. Yeah, uh, the Knicks started uh, the game very tight against the Heat, and then uh, afterwards they started getting the three ball, and uh, Felton played great for them. He was great in the hole, and I think this was a great win for the Knicks this season, and I think uh, it'll, it'll be great for them in, in the uh, later coming games. Absolutely. Um, you have to love everything about last night. The fact that we're playing without arguably our three best players. Everyone's talking about Mello's out with the stitches. You also have to remember that Stoudemire's not playing. He's hurt as well as Shumpert. So as long as we can get these players back and they could gel as a team and play with chemistry, I love where we're at. This is the second time we've beaten the Heat by 20 points. Mm -hmm. A lot of people mm -hmm. argued that the first one was a bit of a fluke because it right, happened right after the hurricane, and it didn't seem like the Heat players really wanted to play. Yeah. But last night's win is a big statement win for the New York Knicks. I have to yeah. say, like, obviously it was a great win, but you have to put it in perspective, the Heat aren't playing great yeah, right now. They not, almost yeah. lost to the Spurs without any of the main, mm -hmm. the great Spurs players, and they lost to the Wizards the other night. Yeah. Like, they're not playing great, but it's a great win because we were missing so many good players. So it, it balances out, but the Heat aren't playing at the top of their game I right think now. that, um, you know, going from such a loss at Washington, they should have came into that game a lot stronger than they they're did. Just, they're just, the chemistry's off right so now. So are the Knicks the best team in the East right now? As of right now, you have to say they are. To be the best, you have to beat the best. And they've done that twice, convincingly. As you said, they beat, beat them by 20 both times. It's, they've been playing great right now. They're undefeated at the Garden. Melo's playing at MVP level. And the chocolate savior, Mike Woodson, <laughs> is easily the coach of the year right now. And the, the best thing about the Knicks is they're not even at full strength right now. Like you said, Iman Shumpert's not back, isn't back yet. When he comes back, he's going to add more defense. Marcus camby has been banged up all year. When he comes back, he's going to have a great defensive contribution off the bench. And when Stack comes back, Amari Stoudemire, if they can make it work, not only will the Knicks be the best team in the East, they will be the best team in basketball. The Knicks, this isn't a fluke. Like, the Knicks aren't going away. They are legit. Like, they're not going anywhere. You're yeah, I definitely agree. Every point that you made, I completely agree with. Um, they are for real. You know, if yeah. they go in playoffs this year, like, I'm looking for a great season and a long season from them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to say that, but I think it's a little bit too early to just say the Knicks are the best. You know, they're making noise, and they're showing teams that they can beat the best of the best, but... I don't want to go off and say that they're the best team right now because it's still really early. I think if they uh, play Miami more and they, and they beat them throughout the regular season, then I'll consider them the best. But right now, it's, I think it's just too early. I'd have to agree. Like, yeah. In the long run, I feel like the Heat are still the favorite right now to win the East. But as of right now, they beat the Heat both times they played, oh, yeah, and they, they're playing the best yeah. basketball in the East. So as the question is right now, I do think the next Yeah, right yeah. now, yeah, because they've got the chemistry going. Absolutely. But with the Heat, you know... You know, we see what happens. They, they pour it on at the end, so we just got to see what happens. Absolutely. Well, either which way, it's a big statement win for the, for the Knicks and for our, uh, for our Knicks fan base here. It's a, it's a really yes. inspiring thing to see in the earlier in the year that we're going to compete with the best teams in the NBA. So that's great to see. We're going to uh, go to a commercial break right now. We're going to come back and talk about Major League Baseball. Stay with us. A great moment in cinema history. Welcome back to our second quarter debate. Right now we're going to focus on Major League Baseball, but more specifically the New York Yankees. It's the offseason right now for baseball and a usually busy time for the New York Yankees faithful to be focused on what's going to happen for the upcoming year, but not so much right now. We've lost a couple players here and there, but no big signings yet. So right now we're going to get our reactions 
and our feelings on what the Yankees need to do to improve their chances of having a more successful year next year. What do you think, Carl? Uh, well, with the loss of Isro and uh, Nick Swisher as a free agent, or no, sorry, the other way around, with uh, Nick Swisher as a free agent, and um, I think that the Yankees need to look for an outfielder, and I think they should sign Cody Ross because, you know, they're talking to him, they're trying to get a, a contract done with him, and he has the mentality to fit with this Yankees team, and I think that and the addition of Cody Ross would be very crucial for them because uh, Swisher, you know, he's gone in East Row. He's a free agent, so uh, I think that would that would really help them in the offseason. Okay, we got rumors going on right now about Euclid signing and Swisher's definitely going to leave. So what do we think about that? Um, I'm going to say that it would be good for them to sign Euclid just for the one the, the one year because we don't have a third baseman until a Rock comes back. And even if he does come back, the point of him coming back very strong is kind of like leery. So... I think with that, I think they need to sign Euclid, and also um, they have other positions they need to fill. You know, they need an outfielder, so they need to step up their game and stop playing like a small market. You know. Absolutely. I never thought I'd see the day where Kevin Euclid might be a Yankee, but in the, and honestly, it's what they need. They need an infielder. He's a, a really good in, a defender. He can play third and first base. He can be A Rod's replacement while he's out. And even when A Rod comes back, if if Euclid is signed with the Yankees and he's playing well, I think it's time A Rod becomes a full time DH. His body can't handle a full season. Since when he came up in the league in 1996 until 2000, he averaged 153 games a season. Since 2000, 2007, he's only averaged 124 games a season. He, his body can't handle a full season at third base. They need a guy that can be there consistently. And they need A-Rod's bat in the lineup. And the only way to preserve his body is by DHing him. And I think that's the decision they have to make. With Russell Martin leaving, I'm okay with it. He wasn't a great hitter. He was under 200 for most of last year. He wanted a longer contract. He got that in Pittsburgh. He can go have fun with A.J. Burnett there. I think what they have to do with catchers is go out and sign A.J. Brzezinski from the White Sox. He's a free agent. Give him a one-year deal. He's a power hitter. He had 27 home runs last year. I think he can match that production in Yankee Stadium. And it'll be the perfect one-year gap, uh, gap filling for the top prospect, uh, Austin Romine, to develop more as a hitter because he's the future catcher of that team. And with Ichiro, they got to bring him back. He killed it last year. He's a free agent. He wants to come back to New York. He's a way better hitter than Brett Gardner. I don't want to see Brett Gardner in the lineup every day. I'd rather see him on the bench as the fourth outfielder and a pinch runner. I want to eat your own pinstripes. And Swisher, you were the ultimate bro. You were fun to watch, but you weren't a perfect fit anymore. You were terrible in the playoffs. You want a long contract, and you got to go. Everything that you guys said, I completely agree with. We need to make moves. This can't be the season that the Yankees don't do anything and expect to contend in the AL East. This is the best division in baseball by far. It's completely different than every other year. The division is now upside down with the Yankees and Red Sox realistically at the bottom of the division. The Orioles, the Toronto Blue Jays, and the Tampa Bay Rays are all teams to be reckoned with now. They are not, we're not going to be able to walk in to the Orioles ball par ballpark now and take two out of three every single time. These are good teams, and this is an offseason where we have to make moves after a really down playoff year last year. And it's not happening no, right now. No other team's afraid to spend anymore except for the Yankees. The Yankees exactly. are so determined to get under the 189 cap right. that the 189 million cap that they're not going out there and being aggressive like they usually are. And that's going to hurt them, especially with how Toronto made the big trade this offseason, getting Jose Reyes and Josh, John, uh, Josh Johnson. And like the team is the, the AL East is so tough. The Yankees have to get better. Yeah. They're not good with that where they at right now. I Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we're all in agreement here, saying if the Yankees don't do anything, it's really going to be a scary year come baseball time um, in the spring. But I mean, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. Hopefully they make some more big moves because we definitely need more power in that lineup and some more depth. And Derek G is looking a little chubby right now. He needs to lay off <laughs> the snacks. I mean, he's yeah. the captain. <laughs> no, he'll be in shape by spring training, but come on, Derek. Lock it up, dude. Yeah. I hear that. All right, stay with us. We're going to go to halftime. We're going to come back for our third quarter debate and talk about some college football. Welcome back. Our third quarter debate is going to be on college football. Some of you may already know that last night were the college football awards. Um, a lot of awards were given out last night to a lot of the top players in college football. Tomorrow, as everyone knows, is the Heisman presentation. So we're going to right now run down the winners and losers last night, our feelings on that, and then our feelings on the Heisman. So just for you who, do, who don't know, the most outstanding player award, player of the year, outstanding lineman, defensive player of the year, and outstanding linebacker all went to Manti Teo, um, senior linebacker from Notre Dame. Outstanding wide receiver went to Marquise Lee from USC. Coach of the year, Brian Kelly, Notre Dame. Nation's best running back, Monty Ball. And nation's best quarterback went to Johnny Menzel, also known as Johnny Football from Texas A&M. So we're going to get our reactions to that and then talk about the Heisman a little bit. What do you think? 
Mati Teo is an absolute beast, and he deserved to get most of the defensive awards. And whatever team drafts him in the spring is going to get a Ray Lewis type leader on defense for the next decade. That being said, the Heisman should go to Johnny Football. Johnny Football is a redshirt freshman. I don't care about his age. I don't want to hear that argument that Teo is a senior, so he deserves it. No, if, he, if you're eligible for the award and you have the better season, you should win it. And Johnny Football has done that. He ha he's broke Cam Newton's SEC record for total yards. He has over 4,600 4, total yards, and he's got a game left where he can easily eclipse 5,000 yards with how he plays. He dominated Alabama, which in my, in my eyes was the reason he, want, he should win the Heisman. He dominated the number one ranked defense in the league. He beat them. They couldn't stop him. And he combined for 43 total touchdowns, 19 rushing, 24 passing. And if it wasn't for Johnny Football beating Alabama, Notre Dame wouldn't have even been ranked number one. So you have to factor that in. And come Saturday, Johnny Football, his new nickname is going to be Johnny Heisman because he should win it and he deserves it. <laughs> okay. What do you um, think, I'm going to agree with Dylan. Uh, I want to see Johnny Manziel win the Heisman. But I also want to congratulate Brian Kelly on winning the Coach of the Year because going from Notre Dame, like we talked about it last week a little bit, and it's nice to see that program develop a little bit more um, into number one and, you know, everything. But I want to congratulate him on winning because he led the Irish to a 12-0 season, and it's good to see that program back on its feet. Okay. Uh, I agree with all the awards that were given out last night, except I think Jarvis Jones should get some credit. He's, I think, the most dynamic player on defense in college football, and he should have won the uh, most defensive, the best defensive player of the year. He had 77 tackles, 12 and a half sacks, uh, seven forced fumbles, and he's he's a monster. I think that he's actually a better linebacker than Ma Manti Te'o. But Manti Te'o's team is number one, so I could see why he won those awards. Their defense was uh, number two in the country, so I understand that. But uh, with the Heisman, I think Manziel should win it. He's a uh, the best player in college football. He's a freshman. When you watch him play, it's not like any other player in the league, and I think that that's a that's the one thing that really gets it. Like uh, Dylan said, he beat Alabama. That that gives him you know that gives him the award right there because Alabama is the best defense in the league, and he's the only team to ever beat him beat Alabama. So. Okay, um, I agree with everybody said. The only thing that I don't like is the entire Heisman talk right now being talked about Manti Te'o. Half the reason that people want to give it to him is that he's a senior, he's a great leader, you know, he's on Notre Dame, and he's like the face of the franchise. I understand all that. Like, that's, that's great. Johnny Manziel, it's the, it, Texas A&M's first year in the SEC, which is by far the toughest conference in football. They won 10 games in their first year. If you would have said this time last year that a freshman quarterback is going to lead Texas A&M to a win over Alabama and a 10-win season, he would have got, you would have gotten laughed at. That people are completely overlooking the fact that he had a better year than Manti Teo strictly because of their age. I understand leadership can play into it, but I'm sick and tired of hearing about leadership be talked over Johnny Manziel's stats versus the best five defenses in college football. I know Notre Dame has a great defense, but I'm telling you right now that statistically, the offenses and defenses in the SEC are better than the conferences than the schedule that Notre Dame played, and that has to play into a, that has to be a factor in this. And that kind of bothers me. I do think it's going to be incredibly close. This is the first time in a couple of years that when that envelope gets opened, we really don't know who's going to win. So it should, you know, be an exciting Saturday and something that won't be able to predict. But either which way, I hope Manziel wins, as the rest of you guys do. But if Manti Teo wins, it won't be not earned. But it just kind of it's disappointing the, to me that the voters love the Notre Dame story, like yeah, you said. Yeah, he's a senior. He's the leader of the, the defense. They're undefeated. They love that story. But like you said, Johnny Manziel is a freshman, and he shattered the SEC record for total yards against the best, the best conference in college football. He's gonna, he has a chance to get over 5,000 total yards in the SEC as a freshman. He is the Heisman. He had the yeah. best season. And the records that he broke are other Heisman winners. Cam They're Newton. not just mm -hmm. records that were just sitting there, oh, it's no big deal. He, he broke Cam Newton's record this year. Cam Newton had 4,300 total yards. He's already at 46, and he has a game left. Yeah, like, he yeah. didn't just break the records. He shattered them. Yeah. And the records that were broken by Cam Newton... Well, you know, Tim Tebow, other Heisman winners. Yeah. So I, don't, I just don't see – I understand that people are going to make the case that Teo is not going to win because he's a defensive player. But you have to understand that what Manziel did is unprecedented, and he deserves credit for that. Yeah, if, I, if he didn't win the award, I'd be actually very surprised just because all the records he broke and the fact that he's a redshirt freshman in the SEC and getting all the success that he did. I mean, I understand you can make that case for Teo, but, but Johnny Manziel is just – he's a monster, and I think that if he doesn't win, then – there's, there's some, that's something to say about the Heisman, how winners get the trophy. I mean, we've seen it in the past. Defensive players usually don't get it in the first place. Charles Woodson's the only player to get it. So I think that if, if uh, Manti Teo wins it, that'll say something for the future of the Heisman Trophy and, and along with defensive players if they're worthy of it. Absolutely. All right, great debate. So we're going to come back with our fourth quarter. We're going to talk about the NFL.
Stay with us. Welcome back. Our fourth quarter debate is going to be on the NFL. There are several teams out there that really aren't doing too well in the quarterback department. So right now we're going to have a debate on which team is the worst right now in terms of having a quarterback. Because especially this year's draft is not deep with quarterbacks. So this is not a time that you want to have a position problem at that spe specific position. So Carl, what do you think? Oh, uh, when, when you first think about QB controversy, obviously you think about San Fran, but then you're like, wait a second, those are two good quarterbacks. It's not that big of a problem. The Jets have three quarterbacks that can all start and none of them are very good. So, you know, I think the Jets have the biggest problem. they got to decide between Sanchez if they want to keep him or if they want to bring McElroy in as a rookie, see how he does. But honestly, I think Rex Ryan has the biggest problem right now. It's, it's going to be tough for him to see who does the best because, you know, it's New York. It's a, it's a big market team, and whatever he does he affects his career and his future as a New York Jet coach. So I think okay. that's the biggest one. Yeah, I agree. I think the Jets is the biggest controversy right now. With Team Tebow, like, you'd have to develop the Jets all around Tim Tebow if you want to change that quarterback position. Sanchez, he's not pulling anything forward for the Jets. I would like to see them give McElroy um, a chance because you have nothing to lose at this point, and that, I think that's the worst problem right there. Okay, Dylan? I think the Jets quarterback situation is hilarious. The Jets fans are demanding a seventh round quarterback that was J Greg McRoy, who's only thrown seven passes in his career. That's how bad it is. But there is actually a situation worse. And that's out west in Arizona. John Skelton just got named the starter for the third different time this season in 12 games. He's replacing rookie Ryan Lindley, who was horrible, who replaced Skelton, who took over for Cobb, who took over for Skelton in week one. That's how much of a mess that quarterback situation is right now. And none of them three are even good quality starters. You can say what you want about Mark Sanchez, but his stats are better than all of the Cardinals quarterbacks combined. Mark Sanchez's pass rating is 71. All, of their quarter all three of their quarterbacks, 63. Mark Sanchez has 12 touchdowns. All three of their quarterbacks have 10. He's outperforming the entire Cardinals quarterback staff. That's how bad they are. And I just feel bad for Larry Fitzgerald. He's a great wide receiver. He's having a terrible year. He will never speak up about it, but he signed a huge contract. He was disappointed they didn't bring in Peyton Manning. Could you imagine how dynamic that team would be if Peyton Manning was there with that wide receiver court, Larry Fitzgerald, Andre Roberts, and rookie Michael Floyd? Like, they had, they'd have a good chance to be a, a, a compete in the NFC West. And there's just such a mess right now. And Jets fans should, feel, should honestly be lucky they don't have three terrible quarterbacks like the Cardinals do. They have, the Jets have decent quarterbacks. Okay. I, what you're saying is right, but the Jets have the worst in terms of the quarterback because they're on the hook for these quarterbacks. They just re-signed Mark Sanchez to an extension. If the Cardinals want tomorrow, they can drop all three of them and bring in us three to try out. They have no responsibility. <laughs> or you, I'm a gunslinger, no, so I mean... There's I no tie to these quarterbacks. They really... They, like, next year, they could bring in whoever they want to. They could sign a free agent. The Jets right now are tied to Mark Sanchez. They don't know what they have in Greg McElroy. And the Tebow experiment was never even, like, not that it didn't work. They didn't even get a chance to work. So you know in Arizona that you don't have a quarterback. The problem with the Jets is that you really don't know if you do or don't. Greg McElroy, like you said, only seven passes. We don't know if he can be good. But you have to, you have to understand that Greg McElroy is not a scrub. I understand he was drafted late, but he led an Alabama team to a national championship at the top program in the country. He won a state championship the in high school in Texas. The defense led them more than Greg McElroy. I understand. He was but, a manager in that, in that system. But he still, he still went to a top-tier program. He's yeah, not a scrub. True, he didn't true. come from San Diego State like Ryan Lindley. He's not from a small school. He can play quarterback. You have to see what you have there. The Tim Tebow thing really backfired in their face, just like we all predicted when they signed him last year. It was going to be a big problem. Mark Sanchez isn't strong enough mentally to deal with them bringing Tebow in. He's been looking over his shoulder ever since, and on top of all the injuries that have happened, it has just brought the Jets team completely down this year, and you can't blame anybody. That would be, that would be my argument for the Cardinals quarterback situation being worse, because you don't know what you have in Greg McElroy. He could turn out to be good. You know what you have with the Cardinals quarterback. Skelton's not good. Cobb has been a complete bust, and they paid him a lot of money, and Lindley has not played good at all as a rookie. McElroy's played better even in the shorter span that he played. So I think the Cardinals situation is so much worse. They don't have anything. Agreed. Yeah, but I think, I think both that jokes. the Jets being such a uh, it's so much publicity is that that's why it's so stressful for them and that's why they like Sanchez is cracking, Tebow no shot, and like McRoy like. But could you imagine how know. bad the media would treat if treat the Jets quarterbacks if they had the Cardinals quarterback yeah, staff? It'd be oh, yeah. so much it's worse because it's different environments. That's Arizona. This is New yeah, York. Yeah, exactly. People Jets fans would have attention. no quarterback to root yeah. for in that, with those three quarterbacks because they're all terrible. 
Either which way, we can all agree that as a fan of the Cardinals or the Jets, you can't be too thrilled. <laughs> Sucks to with suck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. So we're going to come back right now, take a break, um, and our last debate is going to be on some mascot problems we have down in New Orleans. Stay tuned. Cash, cash, money. Understanding more about yourself, because when you go through it, you see who you really are. Want to party, go have fun. That's the college experience. More homework this week. Just partying. Getting involved. Learning how to save the hard way. Being independent. College experience is whatever you make. Welcome back. Our fourth quarter debate is going to be on the NBA. Recent news, the New Orleans Hornets are planning on changing their mascot to the Pelicans. So right now we're going to have a little debate. Who, what is a scarier mascot, the Hornets or the Pelicans? This, this isn't even close for me. Over the summer, the grocery store I work at was infested with bees. I'm, no joking, I killed probably close to 100 bees this past summer. I'm not scared of any bees. Pelicans, they're big birds. Right? If they're in a flock and they're angry and they attack, it's no joke. And no one wants to get pooped on by a pelican. <laughs> but the thing is, they shouldn't make this an intimidating mascot. They should have fun with it. They should cash in on Anthony Davis, give the mascot a unibrow, <laughs> he has a big mouth. They should have random items in the mouth every game. He gives out jerseys, tickets, whatever. Give them out to the fans. Have fun. And he should carry around white silly string, looking like bird poop, and go up to opposing fans and spray him with bird poop. And imagine a shoot around if the Pelican sneaks up behind Kobe Bryant and sprays him with white silly string. That'd be hilarious. They need to cash in and have fun. They don't need to be an intimidating Pelican. It's a Pelican. Like, come on. And like, it would just be a fun story. They, it, make it like the Philly Fanatic. Like an obnoxious, fun mascot. You have thought way too much into this. Yes. I put a lot of thought into this, all right? I'm the bee hunter. I killed bees over the summer. All right. I'm not getting any bees. Negative okay, voice. I definitely don't hunt bees. Um, I run from bees. <laughs> but I think they should stay with the hornets because pelicans are just birds to me. Um, oh. I definitely didn't think about this as much as Dylan, but I think they should stay with the hornets. <laughs> all right. Yeah, are you kidding me? A pelican? I don't agree with that. I think that they should stay with the hornets. The pelicans are not scary. They're, they're like... They're seagulls with imagine, big mouths. Imagine a flock of pelicans came after you. I don't Are you care kidding me? The birds. I mean, oh, hornets, the birds. Okay, hornets, that's what you say now. Hornets <laughs> sting you, and I mean, th that's a lot more intimidating than a, a pelican. Pecked by I just think that pelicans. New Orleans should have gone with something better than that. But I understand because Jordan wants to bring back the hornets uh, it's in Charlotte. It's genius marketing. So. It's genius it is. Marketing. It is. It'll be fun. I, don't, It'll be I, I disagree. Now. I don't like the fact that they're going to change the name to the pelicans. I wrote down some of the names of some mascots and some team names that really aren't anything threatening or popular. Get the Packers, the Steelers, the Texans, the Ducks. But all these things came from history, and they had a reason for being named that. I don't like the change to the pelican. If you're going to make a bird your team name, at least let it be a bird of prey. Like the Falcons. The Falcons yeah. are kind of scary. The Pelicans, Hawks, they eat fish. the Black Hawks. A <laughs> pelican, I don't even think pelicans have teeth. Uh, they, got, they, got, they, got, they got beaks. Yeah, they got beaks. <laughs> they do have beaks. You can't argue that. It's the state bird of Louisiana. It makes sense. We'll, we'll see what they decide to do. Either which way, just know I'm not in support of the pelican. I am the bee hunter. Who am I? So right now we're going to go into our hunter. final thoughts. And we're going to go to Dylan first and see what you got for us. Here at UA Overtime, U Albany's number one television program, we like to give back to the people. And but that being said, my final thought is going to be a shout out my friend, Bryant Race, who's on the Marist Rugby team. They recently just won the Tri-State Rugby Conference. They're going to Nationals in the spring. Brian's a big fan of the show. He watches every week. I know he watches. He's going to be watching this, so I just want to shout out to him. Good luck. And for the rest of the people, it's the last show of the semester. I just want to thank you for watching me. I appreciate it. I know you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next semester. All right, Megan? Okay, on a serious level, um, I want to bless the families and the victims right. of the tragedy that um, the Kansas City Chiefs witnessed. And um, other than that, I hope that they can move past this and that they can um, continue with their season and uh, kind of like let it go, but remember at the same time. Okay. Yeah, my final thoughts are uh, more of a football note. Just I think that Peyton Manning's been playing very well with the Broncos, and he's looking like the clear MVP right now. He's got better numbers than anyone else, and it'd be really surprising uh, to see the, the Denver Broncos go far in the playoffs, but I think they could do it with Peyton Manning. He's a great leader. Tom Brady's MVP. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, All right. Um, my final thought is more focused on the college football awards last night. Me and my friends got into a little discussion about how the top three quarterbacks up for the best quarterback of the year were Braxton Miller, Johnny Manziel, and Colin Klein from Kansas State. And one thing we really talked about is the fall off that some of these kids have when they come out, these athletic quarterbacks, when they come out of college football and then either get drafted in the sixth or seventh round or don't get drafted at all. We kind of brought up the discussion that Johnny Manziel, Colin Klein, and Braxton Miller, there's a chance that not one of those three are going to play quarterback in the NFL. Just kind of something to think about. And they brought up this morning, Stephen A. Smith pointed out that 
Um, a lot of their hopes are going to rely on Russell Wilson because he's a prototypical running quarterback. He's not as tall as the usual, you know, 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, so if he does well over the next two, three years, that could also fare well for Johnny Manziel and other athletic quarterbacks who are not the prototypical 6'6 six, six pocket passer. But that's just something we were talking about. Um, I want to thank you all for watching our show. It's our last show of the semester, so everyone have a great break. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. It's UA underscore overtime. And uh, thanks for watching. Everybody have a good break. Happy Hanukkah. Give the Pelican a unibrow. <laughs> and happy Hanukkah. <laughs>